So um, I'm thrilled to be doing this tonight. I, I love talking about this topic and it's um, right now I think it's about four degrees Fahrenheit outside my office. So hopefully we'll, if some of you are in cold, cold climbs, you'll get to see some, some fun images tonight. So this r rather long title is really about examining how sustainability and health two things I'm very interested in have been affected by about uh, 10 years of my experience with the nonprofit in Guatemala. So, okay, there we go. So here we are um, starting with our, hopefully our only fuzzy slide. Um, if you don't know where Guatemala is, it is almost due south of where I'm giving this webinar from. I'm uh, in Chicago area and that's at the uh, southern tip of Lake Michigan, which is just to the right of states in the United States. And that's where we're gonna be speaking about tonight. So this is the place that I love to go to. Some people go to Paris, I would go up here. And um, I work with a nonprofit up in the very deforested mountains of the northwest section of Guatemala. They're called the Highlands, and they're populated by a Mayan group of people called the Mom, and that's also the name of the language they speak. I've gotten to know people that you can see in this slide. There are some of the agricultural promotores or the, the local staff who work, um, in this case, with the agricultural arm, and here we are up at about 10,000 feet uh, looking at some plots that people have farmed. Okay, I, I always like to know where people are coming from, particularly if I don't know them and, and I'm listening to a talk like tonight's talk, which is a little bit more subjective than some of the other webinars. So I'm going to give you a little bit of where I'm coming from. This is uh, my backyard in uh, Chicago, Illinois, in the Midwestern part of the United States. It's pretty urban and I've grown up here. Uh, so I'm, I guess I'm really a Midwesterner. I grew up in the city of Chicago and uh, had parents that were painters and photographers. So that was a bit of my bend. And I had really a, a pretty good classic liberal education that encouraged me to be very skeptical and always ask questions and go to original sources. I'm also married to a Swede and we, we make annual visits there. This is about four hours northwest of Stockholm. It's very interesting to go between Sweden and Guatemala because they are, they are at different ends of the sustainability and health spectrum. And I've, lear I've learned a lot from that, that leap. Much of my life I've been a writer and teacher and you can see um, that's me in the purple shirt on the left and down on the right, a place I love to teach at, uh, Chicago Center for Green Technology. Maybe some of you have heard of it. And I did some work there with a Green Corps, which was a program to uh, teach ex-felons uh, skills they needed to be in the green industry. Here you go. Here are some details about how I actually work. I'm not actually, I'm, I own my business. There's no co-owner. Co I do mostly residential and um, mostly regional in the Midwest, but I have worked out near Boston and then a little work in Sweden. And I like that I work between urban and suburban. Our, our soil is very different down by the lake here in Illinois, and you have sandy uh, soil and if you go out further west you have a lot of clay and very different kind of conditions except for the um, pH. At any rate, I think I was a little naive when I got into my business because it was very natural for me to practice triple bottom line and everybody finds that differently but here just healthy planet people in business but it occurred to me as the years went on that there were a lot of choices I had made unconsciously that other people had made consciously, but that was very natural for me to pursue that kind of practice. And here you can see, uh, how did I get here? So there I am on a motor scooter in Guatemala, and I want to chart the trajectory a little bit. About 30 years ago, I visited the Yucatan and I saw Mayan ruins. Maybe some of you have seen those. I was so impressed with the Maya that I wondered what they were doing in the contemporary world. And um, 
Oh, then there was a long leap, and um, I actually ended up doing some work with refugees during the war in the 80s. And I ended up about 10 years ago becoming a donor to a nonprofit in California that supported a Guatemalan NGO. These are the contemporary mom. This is on Day of the Dead in the cemetery in the town near where we work. And um, again, the people we work with are the mom people, and that's what they speak. So we're going to look today at some of the things that I've learned about sustainability and health from working up in these um, extremely impoverished indigenous mountain villages. This is not, if you've been to Guatemala, there are many beautiful, beautiful areas of Guatemala. This is not one of them. Um, in fact, when I go, there are hardly any tourists, and uh, I actually like that. So the group I work with is on the left. They're called AFAPADI, and the acronym, the name in Spanish basically just means Association for Development. I started working with them about 10 years ago being a donor for reforestation. And um, they are really, in the 80s, I had met incredible people in Guatemala. And these people impress, impress me even, even more so. They've remained uh, committed with integrity and hard work and sacrifice and joy and a good sense of humor. I've learned so much. After uh, some years as project director for that other nonprofit, I started something called Sustainable Sharing with Guatemala in order to have a more sustainable infrastructure, not only to support AFAPADI, but also to, to bring sustainable models back and forth across mm -hmm. borders. This occurred partially because I learned so much going down for, for the years that I did. You can see on the, on the right, in the green shirt, is one of our board members. And I would not have started SSG without young people being interested. Here's a mission statement from um, SSG. It's written rather generally that uh, we just got our IRS exemption. But we particularly work with AFAPADI. They're people who share our vision and values to build working models across borders and cultures. And you can read here some of the things that we promote in these models. That's me in the green shirt. You'll see me with a lot of different hair lengths because these, these slides come, I think, from 2007 on. So here we go. Um, we have to start off by asking, what is sustainability? And I think all of us have not only different definitions, but our definition is changing. For the purposes of tonight's talk, I'm going with this definition here. We make a diverse world that will be here for several generations, used to be seven. One that takes the globe as an integrated ecosystem in which we play a part of the whole, physically, culturally, and economically. In terms of sustainability with my clients, I really try to get my clients to take a few steps at a time. Big change is frightening for most of us. And I found that if I can get clients just to connect with something simple, that will encourage them to go on and get very committed. What is health? And again, I think we're speaking both literally and metaphorically. Most of us in our industry are very familiar with the health of the ecosystem and the components that have to work for that all to function. Um, it was very interesting here a couple of years ago when we had West Nile and all the crows were killed. And it was, it was fascinating to see a part of the whole ecosystem that was missing and how that affected the health of the whole system. Now we have a lot of rabbits. But um, anyway, I think we all can know that when the parts of the system are stressed, the whole system is in weakened health. So we want to strive for having a very healthy system whether it's the body of the planet or our own bodies that can manage all kinds of stress. So where are we talking about? I'm going to get a little more specific about where in Guatemala. Um, here we are, Guatemala is below Mexico, and you can see that I wrote drug trade. That's because to get drugs into Mexico, you have to go through Guatemala, and that has changed the tenor of what's been going on 
in Guatemala. Here we are. This is a bit of a messy map, so I have that uh, big blue arrow on the left. It's pointing to the departments in uh, Guatemala, and where we work is in the upper left, the pink one. The, both the department and the main city in it are called Weiwei Tenango. Um, actually, if you've been to Tika, you can see that's way up in the north near Flores in the Paten, which is jungle. But we're down here in you go to the city of Weiwei, Tenango, and then just a little bit north and west, you can see Ishtawakan, and that is the uh, name of the nearby town where we work. This will give you a little better sense of what's going on in terms of the land there. Again, you can find Weiwei, Tenango, and go, that little red line is the Pan American Highway, go over to Ishtawakan. I'm going to speak a little bit now about the conditions there. Here we go. Here's another topographical map, and you can see uh, we're working mm, near the S in Sierra de la Cuchumatanes. But you can see that the good land is on the Pacific coast. There's some on the Atlantic coast and in from there. And you can see that we're working up in uh, uh, volcanic ridges. I think this map should be very helpful in terms of industry and agriculture. You can see very clearly here where it says Weiwei Tenango, and um, there are definitions of what's happening in these areas. Basically, uh, Weiwei is located in, let's see, that lower brown guide where it says basic subsistence agriculture, mostly corn with secondary crops of bean and squash wheat, potatoes, deciduous fruits, and sheep grazing in higher areas. I haven't seen any wheat or potatoes, but I have seen all the others. And people used to live on the, this combination of the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. But you can see it is not where the good land is. And um, one wonders why people are farming up here. And this is one of the villages uh, we work at. That's one of the higher villages up at about 10,000 feet. Afapati and SSG work with about a dozen villages. Each village has very different uh, particulars. Some have more land and less water. Some have uh, more water and less education. They're all kind of variables depending where on the mountain people are. But in general, the land is not good. People do not have enough really to feed their families. And um, the history of Guatemala is that it was basically owned by about seven families for a long time. And then after the war, some things changed. So some of this poor land became available for, for uh, indigenous people to buy. You can see that little triangle in the middle is one of the people in our program who's been doing, uh, working with Afapati, and they're using organic agriculture and trenching. One of the issues in switching over to organic ag, even though the yields are ultimately higher, you need a year or two of transition. And during those first couple of years, your yields aren't so high. So when you have people that are living on, on the edge in terms of uh, food supply, that's, that's a difficult switch. You can see here how uh, some of the soil is just rock. People break this up with machetes by hand and eventually grow in the middle of this rock. One of the other challenges that people's growing plots are very located a great distance away. You might have to spend three to four hours going to each of them. So you can imagine how much uh, transit that takes. Corn is the absolute crux of the Mayan culture. It's uh, there not just nutritionally, but um, spiritually, emotionally, historically. So, but one of these, um, the combination of, of being conditioned to eat corn and not having adequate uh, nutrition is a problem. Now here's a slide, I, I, when I talked to Lisa earlier, I, I think I better go into a little more detail than I originally thought. 
Um, Guatemala is a very unique country in Central America because it is the only one that still has a substantial part of the population, almost half, that's indigenous. And um, that's what makes Guatemala very wonderful, but is also very challenging because like most other uh, Latin American countries, the closer you are in race to the original Spanish descendants from the conquest, the higher up you are in the social pecking order. And uh, in Guatemala, you basically, indigenous people have two options. They can live in their original communities where they're very challenged by poverty and education and land ownership, or they can move to the cities where they're extremely exploited. So I feel very lucky to be working with the people I do. As a private person, I would, I would not have the access that I have had these past 10 years. I don't think this slide needs very much explanation on the effects of deforestation. You can see here the tremendous erosion that is happening. And uh, Guatemala, like the rest of us, is experiencing more extreme climate conditions due to climate change. Normally, they have a dry and a rainy season. Um, Let's see, the dry season is from about November through April, May, and then the rain starts in May through about October. But of course, the, uh, the dry season has become more full of drought, and the rainy season has had torrential, torrential rains that cause much more erosion with the deforestation. They have a scarce resource, wood, for several reasons. Uh, one, because that's what people have been using for fuel, for cooking, and two, because the timber companies have been logging. This is the, the river down in the, the, the town. Uh, I should say that um, Apapati has two offices, one in the, the city of Quetzaltenango, which is about a four-hour drive from the villages we work in and the villages we work in are lo uh, the office is located in a, a village called Kasaka and it is outside of a town uh, the town of San Ildefonso de Ixtahuacan where this was taken you can see this is the river in Ixtahuacan and um, garbage is always a big issue it was very interesting to me to find after years of going that the reason people have a different concept of garbage is because people always drop their refuse on the ground, but of course in the past it was natural. It was you know, maybe a corn husk or a fruit pit. But uh, in our wonderful world of plastic, uh, this is what it looks like there now. As I mentioned before, each village is very different in terms of access to uh, basic amenities and in particular water. This was quite an extraordinary person and the village had both water, there's a stream just below the soil there, and um, they also had sun, so they, they were able to grow quite a bit there. But most of the villages do not have access to water. Hygiene is limited. You can see this is kind of a typical living space. And at the beginning, uh, I noticed that people were giving vaccines, but they were giving vaccines to their chickens because the chickens were so important in their daily life. Malnutrition is a huge issue there. And as the people, uh, if pregnant women, give birth to children that they cannot sustain in terms of nutrition. It, of course, affects everybody. Now, th this slide you'll actually see twice. It it's, um, contains a lot, I think. Um, Guatemala, as you may or may not know, had a civil war for about 30 years from the 60s until 1996, one that the U.S. government supported and We've had quite an entangled history with Guatemala going back to uh, one of the first CIA coups in 1954. 
But you can see the effects of that war here. The men, uh, many of the men were killed and their skills went with them. So the women were left in charge of the farming. And consequently, in this, you can see that how the corn is stored before um, people get silos. There's also a huge effect of migrant labor, and this has taken me years to understand in any kind of meaningful way. The men go to Mexico for about six months of the year, and in our project, the decisions have to be made with the men, but they're gone half the time. So that's very, that really affects how, how projects work. Again, when you have a community that is, um, has been so impacted by a devastating war and poverty. There are huge effects on health and sustainability. This is a taken on the day of a fiesta, or yeah, the sort of annual party for the town of San Ildefonso. And um, the men have been drinking a lot. But what's interesting to me here, I, I took this picture when I was walking around with the doctor in Afapati, and he said before the war, people would have helped their neighbors if they fell down having had too much to drink. But the social fabric has been so disrupted since the war that people really don't get involved with their neighbors anymore. I should also say that the structure of Afapati, it, it's been in existence about 20 years and was begun by three Guatemalan brothers who are uh, part indigenous and their partners. And uh, one of the brothers is a doctor. He's with a nurse. The two others were trained uh, as ministers, although I didn't have a clue that there was any religious component for years because it's very ecumenical. And um, anyway, I think the next slide, I've lost my arrow. There we go, is for questions. So I don't see any questions in my box, but I don't know if they're going to Riza. Julie, sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if anybody has questions so far, I don't have any in my box. What I actually had a question is how do you, do you communicate? Do you sound fluent in Spanish or is that, or, but they, you said they speak another language. Yes, thank you. Uh, they speak their uh, Mayan language, which is mom, and, and people say, you know, there are about 26 different Mayan languages. They're not dialects. They're quite different languages. Uh -huh. So I, I speak Spanish um, self-taught enough to get by for a couple weeks. And uh, so with both of us, Spanish is our second language. So that's pretty easy to speak to the people that speak Spanish. All of the courses, the you know, workshops in Afapati are spoken uh, basically, or I shouldn't say all, most of them are spoken in MAM, and Afapati has local promotores that are fluent in MAM, and they're conducting most of the classes, unless the classes are taught by maybe one of those six people that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. What about, um, and what's, I, my other question is like, what, what is their take? Cause they're indigenous. They've always probably like worked the land and been in their community. So what's their take on kind of foreigners? <laughs> I, I can't, let's see, only speak to their take on me. I, uh, um, well, you and your group, you know, when you go there, I mean, yeah. they must know you by now, but I mean, in general, right. Well, and I've seen every year there's a, a different volunteer. They, Normally you have to work a minimum of six months. They're thinking of changing that to a year. So I've seen volunteers from, they're mostly from Germany, Belgium, and Spain. Uh -huh. And and people are just phenomenally uh, warm and supportive. And, you know, again, if, if you went by yourself, it's a very traditional culture. And uh, when I go when I'm heading up there, I stop in the city of Antigua, which is near Guatemala City, and it's a very different relationship there between indigenous people and foreigners because it's very commercial. Right, right, and, sure. Yeah, I'm very accepted and treated extremely graciously. Wow, that's nice. So we have two more questions. So um, one person says, 
they're curious how you decided to get involved with an organization like Ofapati and what life experiences led you to Guatemala landscaping and your ideas on social justice, which you may get into eventually. So. Oh, okay. Well, uh, qu quickly, I guess um, I did, when I started studying Spanish in 1984, I, I walked into a potluck that had a film on the refugee camps in Mexico of, of Guatemalan refugees, and that was the start of my connection to Guatemala. Mm. I uh, visited there in the late 80s, and it's, it's my spiritual home. And then I reconnected in 2004 when I felt that some things in our country were, were not going in the direction that I, I would like. And so I decided I would, I would pool money that I usually uh, use to give clients Christmas presents and I would make a donation in my client's name to an organization. I found um, the, the California nonprofit online uh, that supported Afapati and called up the project director. Yeah. And, um, she she asked me to come down that spring in May in May, and I told her she was nuts. And then um, some colleagues said, "Oh, you're you're the one who's nuts. You should go down." So I did, and um, yeah. the people who ran off of potty said, "You know, they told me at that visit. They said you can always come whenever you want. This is your home now." Oh, that's nice. So, how much? Another question: How much time do you spend there each year, and do you teach? Seminars or like, what's your primary role when you go there? <laughs> yes, well, this is what people always ask. Unfortunately, I only can, uh, I'm going down for three weeks this year and I need about a week of travel. So I'll be up in the villages for two weeks. I don't actually teach anything. What I'm, what I'm doing is observing projects that we're funding and seeing how Afapati's strategy has, has changed. I'm giving feedback on their projects and um, how we're, what, what context we're seeing them in and their progress. Mm -hmm. But the, the, what I think what's interesting is that I've been going now for 10 years and it's some questions take 10 years to answer. It's really a community that you have to just peel the layers back on. Wow. So another question is, how do they get their drinking water? I guess they're up in the mountains. How do they get their drinking water is a good question. Uh, well, normally where people don't have water, there are, are springs. And people go, I don't know if any of my pictures show, but they're the plastic jugs that the women carry on top of their head. Yeah. Last year when we were there, there was a month less of the rainy season, and the temperatures were 10 degrees higher, and people were running out of water. But you, you know, basically during the dry season, you just want to have enough water to survive and you can't really irrigate. Um, there are some communities that one slide I showed had a stream nearby. So some communities have water, but in others, it's, it's very tricky. And in the Kasaka, the village where we stay, there is municipal water. So there is a sink with, with uh, municipal water. So they don't have your... They don't capture water. Like I've been in many communities where they have water capture, so they don't do that. Well, part of what Afapati is working with are various forms of that with um, ah. the cisterns and right. um, yeah. I'm thinking of the Spanish word, but there's a, a, a plastic kind of uh, tank at the top. Yeah. And um, so, uh, can you drink the water? I guess the water's can you drink the they water? Can, no, they can they drink can drink it, right? Yeah. They can drink it, but they get sick during the rainy season because everything gets so compromised. When wow. I'm staying up there, we use uh, these third world clay filters. This wow. A clay canteen, and that's what I drink. And most of the time I don't get sick, and sometimes I do, and I'm very careful with water, and one never knows. Wow. Um. Okay, another question is, why are the plots separate from where the villagers live? And are the crops damaged by wildlife or bandits? Oh, oh okay. The, well, the plots are far away because, they're, because the land became available in very irregular ways. And mm -hmm. um, there's just not enough land so people get it when they have the means or it comes up. Mm. Uh, that there are bandits. Hmm, that's interesting. I know Guatemala is, is is known for its violence right now, and some of that is robbing people. But those those issues really don't happen in terms of stealing crops. 
And what was the other question on wildlife? Yeah, no, just how, why are the crops damaged? W what damages them? Yeah, I'm is it, like, yeah, how do they get damaged? Well, primary, yeah, weather. Oh, I weather. Say. I mean, of course, they, there is a big, I think it's a pine, uh, pine bark beetle yeah. infestation now. I just saw it last week out in, in uh, near San Francisco. I think it's the same pest. So wow. they do have things like that, but um, not too much. Okay. Okay, great. Well, let's keep going. There's a few more questions, but we'll see if we have time. Okie dokie. Super. Thank you, guys. Yeah, good questions. Um, you'll get everything that I forget to put in, so that's excellent. So here I just wanted to make a quick little section on how the people in Guatemala are not the other. We're all the same. The connections between the developed and the developing world, quote unquote. Here's a picture of from on the left from Sweden this Christmas when four hours north of Stockholm we did not have a single snowflake. But this was after that spruce had crashed into an electrical cable and uh, 12 hours of no electricity and water reminded me how much we all depend on infrastructure. It's quite different from Guatemala where there isn't as much infrastructure we work, but we're still dependent on all these things that help us to survive. And there, there we are in the plain between Greenland and Canada. And I thought that was interesting because it shows the ice breaking up. And um, of course, there have been many wise people writing about how climate change is changing planet. I think uh, climate change, of course, has global effects. The picture on the left is from last week, uh, north of San Francisco, Point Reyes. If you've ever been there, they've had their uh, worst drought in about 100 years. And I think pretty soon food prices in the rest of the country are going to bring that home to us. But uh, that won't just affect the United States, of course. That will have uh, wider ramifications. and uh, the image on the right is that image you saw before. I had my aha moment when I went back to Guatemala in 2005 in this area near Huehuetenango where I had not visited since 89. And when I saw this erosion, I had a visceral knowledge that the planet didn't honor man-made borders and the loss of this forest there was really a loss for all of us. I think it's clear that we're all vulnerable. Uh, just last month, there was the chemical spill that uh, compromised water in Charleston, West Virginia. And I think it's, it's normally the case that the profit is usually ahead of regulation and uh, we're the people caught in between. So we share that. Food security matters. Here's one of the silos that uh, Afapati helps manufacture for the corn storage, but I know in the city of Chicago, we have food deserts and we have plenty of people lining up for soup kitchens and not, not uh, getting enough to eat. There's also a scarcity of natural resources. Here's one of the better stoves that the project helps to get. They, um, oh, maybe we might, people ask, why don't we use solar? And uh, that's a long answer, but People do change slowly, and so we have these stoves that are better because they conserve fuel and don't use as much. I think here in Chicago, we're near one of the great sources of the world, the best in terms of clean water, but we know that that's going to be interesting down the road when people don't have access. Here we are back in Chicago. Uh, this is right in the middle of downtown, and I think it's very clear that the uh, individual st stresses on individuals in our system weaken our collective health. I saw an article just a few days ago in the New York Times how inequality hollows out the soul. And this quote is from that. One of the well-known costs of inequality is that people withdraw from community life and are less likely to feel that they can trust others working in a community that has really had its bonds of trust ripped apart by a, a brutal war and extreme poverty. I think that's very important. But I wanted to um, recount something I heard. I've been looking. I cannot find it. 
But several years ago, I heard a radio show that talked about inequality in terms of life expectancy. And the point, point was that in countries where the CEO of a corporation makes, let's say, 400 times as much as the worker in that company, as compared to a country where the CEO makes 40 times what the worker makes, the life expectancy of the CEO will be lower in the country where there's more inequality. No matter what access that person at the top has to the best health care, simply by living in the society that they do with that tremendous inequality brings down people's life expectancy. And I think that's a very telling um, statistic. So here, we're going to go to some of the professional and personal benefits that I've experienced from these 10 years of being connected with Afapati. Here is, here is my uh, banker from my local community bank. She told me that uh, everybody teased her, called her La Princesa, because she'd never traveled anywhere. She didn't wear high heels. So anyway, you can see she uh, had a great time and really stretched, both physically and mentally and emotionally. I think we share, give, and learn. Here's uh, Wesley, who you've seen before, a board member who is, so to speak, exercising different parts of himself. And, you know, it's a good thing to not always be in charge or be good at something and to start learning uh, how to do things differently. This was amazing. This man, uh, whose face you can't see, was trying to go peach trees up at 10,000 feet. It's, uh, it's very cold on that side of the mountain, and this, this is in cloud forest. And uh, it didn't work, but you've got to try. I should say that much of where we work is pine or was pine oak forest. And then up, I think it's above 9,000 feet, was cloud forest. There's very, very little. But um, it is quite exciting to drive through some of those oaks and see the, the epiphytes and the bromeliads. It's just, just very amazing. This man in the green shirt actually was illiterate, and now he's one of the agricultural promoters, so he's learning how to teach. I think it's instructive for those of us who are usually teaching to be students and vice versa. I know every time that I give any kind of talk or class, I'm sure I end up learning more than anybody. This is from one of the materials that Afapati uses. Since people are illiterate, a lot of things are done without writing and with games. And um, I think one of the most memorable experiences for me was a workshop where the, um, the nurse told me that people had been asked to count off in groups, one, two, three, in a previous workshop. And it took two hours because that was a concept that just was not in their culture. They, they didn't understand how to count off into group uh, one, two, three groups. So it always makes me question my assumptions. I think for, you can form bonds with people and make deep connections through shared experiences. I don't expect everybody to come down and visit the project, but I think there are ways in which we all connect. For me and for uh, the people I've taken down, I think uh, here you can see the mosquito netting. We're just uh, it's only during the wet season that you have to be protected from insects, and we're pretty much just above the malaria line, so that's not a big deal. But of course, there are the issues with the water and the parasites, and just understanding how people live on a daily basis with uh, primary resources is an education. As I said, when I had that aha moment about the, the forest being decimated and how that affected us all, that really made an impression on me. But I think there's the literal part of it, and there's also the spiritual part of it, and we can't forget that, whatever spirituality means to you. There's a very interesting book um, by somebody named Marco Pogacnik called Nature Spirits and Elemental Beings, I think published by Findhorn Press. and um, He's kind of woo-woo and out there, but he not so much so that the city of Berlin 
Um, the city of Berlin hired him after the wall came down to heal the landscape. So think about that. I think being in this situation has enabled me to get outside my limited perspective. It's quite amazing to work with the Maya who are a very communal culture and to connect to something larger and non-hierarchical. At the beginning of every workshop, people, everybody participates and lights a candle. It's very simple but very meaningful because it, nobody's, uh, nobody's more important than anybody else. And I think this is something important that we can learn from the Mayan culture because our culture is so hierarchical. Um, I'm always freezing here. I'm freezing on some cold concrete floor where people are actually speaking in mom, so I'm pretty concentrated. I think one of the great gifts of working with this project is that I get perspective and I'm incredibly grateful for what I have in my business. What that's caused me to do is that when something doesn't get delivered or a client is not behaving in an understandable way or whatever the, the myriad things that can be disturbing in our profession I almost always can go back to these experiences and and say that things will be okay and I have you know I can go home to a hot shower or air conditioning or food so I'm going to define just a little bit here some more things about sustainability and health that I've learned. Now this is interesting, people always talk about thinking local or eating local and I agree with that but because of the Guatemala project it's gone to a different level for me. So you want to assess these regional conditions not just in terms of the land but people and their culture. So um, as I mentioned the different villages have different constructs. So for example this is um, this is way up at the top of the mountain. People have a lot of land, no water, and no education. So you have those local conditions, but mostly learning about the Maya and their culture. When things don't go according to my expectations, I have to look more deeply and start to understand. Here we are. I told you we'd see this slide again. I talked about it before in terms of the, the men being gone and losing the skills to build the corn silos. But here I put it in because this is something I learned after a number of years. I knew that the people did not understand that when the rats ate the corn and contaminated the corn, that people would get sick from the bacteria. That was not, they weren't educated enough to understand that. But even when they understood that, another element was that in their cosmology, they felt that the rats deserved part of the harvest. So you always want to look at underlying causes of things to, to find solutions. Here's one of the cisterns up in the um, sort of medium high villages. Cisterns make a huge difference, uh, but they're also very expensive. They cost about $2,000, and that's when people in the community are making them together but they will always be um, dependent on the kindness of strangers. So um, water is a big issue and I've learned to look at it just not in terms of the sexiest, biggest um, Western solution. I've had some people be interested in the projects but they're, uh, who work with, with water management systems, but they're always bringing a Western hierarchical sensibility and it doesn't quite fit with what's possible in these communities. Here we are, this is a permaculture workshop and this was just amazing. It was about 90 degrees up in the burning sun uh, this day and people were, there's a level there that that woman is holding. But once, once you've seen permaculture where people's lives depend on it and where it's a matter of um, food or no food, soil or none, it's um, really wakes you up. I think the project has shown me too that people can expand themselves and their community through their vision. This is one of the health promoters. She was a single woman, which is rather unusual in these communities. And she really 
uh, went beyond what she imagined for herself and became a, an integral part of the community. Here's the man who grew the peach trees. He tried to start a nursery one year and um, it didn't work. It was too cold. But what I found incredible is that um, working all these years with Afapati, a huge part of what I've learned is to understand why things fail and then how to solve them and move to the next stage. I think in our, uh, I don't know if this is just true in my region in the United States, but I find at conferences and symposia people are always just sharing their biggest, sexiest project. And I don't learn that much from what's going on. Outside of the industry, I think in life, the people I have learned the most from are those who have had a big failure and have had a really creative response to that and gone to the next stage. So I wish we would share more of some of our failures and what how we got to the next step. This is the only house in the community of Kasaka that had books. This man was phenomenal and actually became a translator and a lawyer, which is beyond belief given the conditions. But I think it's important for all of us to remember that we need to continue educating ourselves. Here too, the woman in the center with the small child, she's the other health promoter. And um, not only is she a role model to these women around her, but what's so important is that she's become a role model to her children. And interestingly enough, to her husband, her relationship with her husband has really, their family unit has changed a lot as she has continued to work with the program. In a community that has suffered so much from the trauma of war, people don't have much opportunity for joy and healing. And so most of the workshops begin with, with a, a exercise that just has people having fun. And also, as you can see, there are always a lot of babies and children at these things. So it helps to um, get the kids <laughs> kind of exercise and having fun for a little while. So I think sometimes we need to bring more of that into our lives. And I try to be cognizant of it when we have board meetings. This is during the dry season. And this is actually a garden, one of the agricultural promoters' son's garden. It looks kind of ratty at this time of the year. But I think what's so important here is that he gave his son his own space and the leeway to experiment and make mistakes and have successes and really get to connect with the land so that he would have an investment in it. And finally here, this is very important. This is um, connecting spiritual and cultural elements. You can see the man in the gray is actually cutting the ribbon on a cistern. That's the inauguration of a cistern and the whole community was celebrating opening some of these. I think Guatemala is a country where people are so poor that they don't have rain gear and when it rains, it really rains. Um, and yet everybody's happy when it rains because they're so connected with the seasons that they, they celebrate the fact that the rains are returning. I think often in, in some of our professional groups, we speak about that lack of connection to the land that people have. And um, perhaps if we made some more spiritual and cultural connections, we'd be okay. I see we're running a little long, so I'm back at questions and um, go for it, Riza. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. It takes me a bit. Um, there's a question, are the local projects all agricultural or about food, re food production? If not, what other projects are there? Oh, well, um, Afapati works in, in health education and agriculture. I was originally connected with agriculture, so I, uh, that's how I worked as the project director for that other nonprofit. But in the last two, three years, um, now that uh, we started SSG, 
we're working with health education and agriculture and part of why that made sense to me is that they do such an integrated job of it that it, it, it became frustrating to work with the, with the agriculture without the other elements. Mm. And then there's another question if, is the land owned communally or by individuals? No, the land is owned by individuals. Hmm. Okay. It, in some cases though, oh, it's, it, 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 it depends on where you are, but sometimes the water is owned more communally and they have a water, I don't know, sort of council, mm -hmm. a municipal council that's deciding about that. Okay, I think that's it, so. All right, so we will zoom through the end. I put in a lot of images, um, but I'll try to go quickly. So here we are. I'm just trying to share some of the working models that I've learned that could work across borders. Some will be obvious. I think this one, avoiding monoculture and GMOs. When you go to a culture that, that grew one crop and you see the depletion of the soil and so forth, uh, you see that that is not the wise path. GMOs, that's a whole other thing. And I'll only say that in a culture like this, where people are so impoverished, um, they can't afford to buy seeds. They've had seeds forever, and it's not time to start. Okay, we know diversity encourages health, whether that's in the land or with people. Compost is really, really important. We talk about that here as well, but up where you have such barren soil, it's absolutely essential. And um, again, I could do a whole whole topic on compost, but um, I won't. I think compost increases the health of triple bottom line. That's uh, fairly self-explanatory in terms of people, planet, and business. You want to think holistically. Here are the, hmm, I'm losing that word, composting toilets. And um, an important part of the program. People are using all parts of everything. Here, one of the health promoters is uh, drying flowers. Those purple ones in the bottom are from the Hakaranda tree, and if you get parasites, that's what you want to make tea from. I think I've really been convinced with these years that cheap, low-tech solutions are flexible and really important. Up in um, communities that are so much on the edge, you want to have the flexibility of cheap things that can be altered and that people can learn to maintain and use. I think I've spoken about this also, really connecting the technology with the culture is an inroad to, to getting people more connected with their land. I think also we've lost um, appreciating manual labor. I know with my clients sometimes, I mean, obviously machines are very good and labor saving for some things, but in other cases, doing things by hand makes a huge difference. Pruning, for example. And I think we need to uh, really teach our clients the, the importance of that. One thing that amazed me is that even with people who don't have enough food, they're always growing a flower or something. They're connected to beauty in every way, and I think this is important also to remember. Here are some corn silos. The, uh, I could also do another talk on these, but what became clear is that it takes so much fuel to transport them up the mountain. We eventually started building them in their specific communities instead of, oops, no, I guess that'll come later. Well, we used to have a factory that I'll show you where the silos were manufactured. At any rate, maintenance rules, we all know that. This place, the, the silo wasn't working because the woman was not maintaining it correctly. And there on the very left, you can see some of those water jugs. Every part is used. Um, here's a little recycling in the garden at the Apapati Resource House. No matter where we are, I think if we make connections uh, among our differences, that's good for all of us. Guatemala is known uh, to be the most violent country towards women, which is amazing given some other countries in the world. But uh, one of the big efforts of the project has been to improve relationships between men 
and women. And that's certainly something that we need to do in our own culture. I think for me, really, I've always, um, no matter what I learn at this project, I, there's always some other assumption to, to question. And I'm seen here with this woman I adore, I've known for a long time, who has some big mental health issues. And um, she had a period of depression and the doctor and nurse wanted to give her some medicine and they gave her pills and she took them all at once on the premise that if they were good, why shouldn't she take them all? So that was a, just another wake up call for me that I had so many built in assumptions. She's doing much better. We all need to explore new products and markets. This is the traditional skill we know about from Guatemala, but this woman actually began a shampoo making cooperative. People did not use shampoo, so we want to think outside their traditional markets. I was speaking about clients doing one step at a time. Here's the client who became very interested in vermiculture and had her worm bin in her basement. She would take it to her daughter's school and give people you know, their first step into sustainability. This is interesting. Um, this is ant poop. It's a traditional fertilizer down in Guatemala. Very good. So don't always dismiss what's worked before. There are medicinal gardens that people have, and here are some women selling some teas in the nearby uh, city. I think it's important for us to get outside of our communities and also develop, you know, have to sell what we're doing. This is at the medical clinic and counterintuitively when USAID came in and partnered with Guatemala, the clinic had a quarter of the service. So funding, that's a broad funding. I've harped on this a bit in terms of learning from successes and failures. And um, what's amazing to me is that the Afapati people just continue. There's always something that uh, would defeat everybody else, but they just continue and keep going forward. As I said, we originally had this silo, the fabrica, the place where they're manufactured. And interestingly, it was funded by a couple of donors here from the states, and they kept thinking bigger, bigger, bigger. But in fact, ultimately, we have to produce these in the individual villages because the cost of the fuel is just too much. You can get about two of these in a pickup per time, and it's too expensive. I think we want to be willing to try changes technologically. This was how we got water when I was there at the beginning, and now this is what it looks like. I thought I would show this because the tree in the foreground, foreground is Casarena, and um, it's, it's not an indigenous tree. I think it's maybe from Australia. A colleague had worked in Africa, and they used the same tree there in deforested areas because it grows very quickly. So the uh, reforesting is a combination of uh, exotics that work for erosion control, fruit trees, and native trees. This is actually a funny picture in terms of Purple Bottom Line and committing to the long term, sustaining the planet and people, society, and our businesses for the long term. That house you see in the middle, the two-story concrete house, was actually owned by the richest man for a while in the village who was the chemical fertilizer salesman. But now uh, that place is empty. He's no longer there. It's important to work on something that feels beyond our control, uh, particularly in terms of climate change. Things can seem a little overwhelming. What's this picture? This is uh, some dear friends in Sweden. Their sons are international ski stars, and they're always going down slopes that you can't even look at, let alone ski down. So I think it's important for all of us to have something that gives us the uh, experience of um, facing something big. I would encourage people just to experiment in both life and in business. Here we are. There's a papaya tree. It wasn't supposed to grow up at the elevation we were at, and it lasted for about a half a dozen years. 
I finally, I would really stress this, these signs here are the only thing that remain of uh, many nonprofit and government organizations. You cannot get people to use and sustain things unless you develop relationships with people and find out their relationship to those things. And that's, um, I think that's, I understand a little bit about that more in terms of business. We have the luxury of peace, but it's something that I think we want to maintain. It makes life a lot easier. And here's a road up in one of those villages. I think we can expect the road to change to be very challenging and unpredictable. We know that, for example, with the internet, things haven't gone the way we imagined, and certainly with climate change, um, who knows what the models will, will bring to bear. This needs no explanation. Don't forget about laughing. And um, finally, I just wanted to uh, bring back that connection between developing and developed countries. There's a client of mine we planted last year. This is only about, I don't know, 20% of their lot and half the house. But I think the people here are the same people as in this house and garden. We have very different lives, but we're the same human cloth. What makes off of body successful is that people have really worked on the internal in order to affect the external. That's the largest open pit gold mine, uh, gold core owned mine in Guatemala. And the people on the left with off of body have worked with the project for a long time. And great uh, traumas in their life and overcome them. And I think that gives them as it does with us, facing the, the internal lets us continue outside. So really what I've learned from Afapati is to be flexible with strategic change. For many years, they worked uh, almost 20 years on health, education, agriculture, and last year they had a strategic change to put everything under the umbrella of nutrition, which is very interesting to me since I'm married to a, this progressive Swedish chiropractor who uh, is focused on nutrition and um, I think what I've really learned is just to continually evaluate the process of how I relate to things and know that everything will change. Finally I wanted to end with this nice image. Um, one of the benefits of going up there is that there's so many children, not, not such a benefit to them because they don't get fed, but for me I'm lucky that I get to connect to kids, and I think it behooves all of us to work and try to preserve things for the future. So uh, that's the end of the talk. I have um, these couple of links here, uh, the SSG websites, sustainablesharing.org, the Afapati website, which is in Spanish but has a lot of good pictures if you want to look, afapati.org and there's my email if you think of any questions after this. Um, I will be in Guatemala um, and in about 10 days and off email but otherwise I'm available. Thank you. Any other questions? Huh, Julie? Yes? Yes, yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I love travel. So I, it's, you know, what you're showing is a lot. I was in Cambodia and it's very similar where, you know, where like a water pump is critical for the village, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, the world is small, really a small place. Like you say, it's, you know, we're all connected. So it's, it's really interesting to see your pictures. Um, I think we had one more question just about whether um, the agriculture is that, um, are, you know, are, are, is the folks there engaged in organic agriculture exclusively? But I guess if that guy, that house was really from the chemical, you know, guy, probably not, right? No, no. In fact, um, people were not doing organic agriculture about 20 years ago when Afapati first started working in that area. And um, interestingly enough, that the men had been using the chemical fertilizers and when the men were, when there was attrition because of the war and um, the lack of jobs and them having to migrate, the women started taking over some of the agriculture and thus um, some people went back to 
organic practice. Wow, interesting. Wow. Um, so I think that's pretty well it. Um, so thank you so much for such an interesting talk. It sounds, uh, it sounds like just a wonderful place to go and get perspective and learn new things. And, you know, it's just a re really interesting. Thank you really for, for um, doing your presentation. And if